in case it's not clear, a teleoperation means you're controlling the truck remotely like it's a video game. So uh, you've gotten the chance to witness it. Does it actually work? Yeah, I mean, so it's... Uh, what are the pros and cons? You know, one of the problems with with doing research like this with, with all these with, with all these Silicon Valley folks is the NDAs. Um, <laughs> oh, right. right. So, so I, I don't, you know, I don't right. know what I'm able to say uh, about sort of watching it, but obviously the they're public statements about sort of what the challenges are, right? And it's about the the latency and, and the ability to sort of in real time. There's challenges there. Let me say one thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking to the, 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 you know, I've talked to the Waymo CTO. I'm in conversations with them. I'm talking to the the head of trucking, Boris uh, Softman, in next month, actually. I'm a huge fan of his because he was, uh, I think, the founder of Anki, which is a toy robotics company. Uh, so I love cute, I love human robot interaction. And he created one of the most uh, effective and beautiful toy robots. Um, anyway, I keep complaining to them on email privately that uh, there's way too much marketing in these conversations and not enough showing off the, both the challenge and the beauty of the engineering efforts. And that seems to be the case for a lot of these Silicon Valley tech companies. They they put up this, uh, you're talking about NDAs. They, they, they've, I, for some reason, rightfully, wrongfully, because there's been so much hype and so much money being made, they don't see the, um, the upside in being transparent and educating the public about how difficult the problem is. It's much more effective for them to say, we have everything solved, this will change everything, this will change society as we know it, and just kind of wave their hands, as opposed to exploring together like these different scenarios, what are the pros and cons, why is it really difficult, you know, what are the what are the gray areas of where it works and doesn't? Uh, what's the role of the human in this picture of the both the sort of the operators and the other humans on the road? All of that, which are fascinating human problems, fascinating engineering problems that I wish we could have a conversation about, as opposed to uh, always feeling like it's just marketing talk. Because mm. a lot of what we're talking about now, even you with having private conversations under NDA you still don't have the full picture of yeah. everything, of how difficult this problem is. One of the big questions I've had, still have, is how difficult is driving? I disagree with you know Elon Musk and Jim Keller on this point. I have a sense that driving is really difficult. You know, the task of driving, just broadly. This is like philosophy talk. How, how much intelligence is required to drive a car? So, from a, like a Jim Keller, who used to be the head of autopilot, the idea is that it's just a collision avoidance problem. It's like billiard balls. <laughs> it's like you have to convert the drive, you have to do some basic perception, a computer vision to convert driving into a uh, game of pool, and then you just have to get everything into a pocket. Yeah. Uh, to me, there just seems to be some game theoretic dance uh, combined with the fact that people's life is at stake and then when people die at the hands of a robot, the reaction is going to be much more complicated. So all of that, but that's still an open question. And the cool thing is all of these companies are struggling with this question of, of uh, how difficult is it to solve this problem sufficiently such that we can build a business on top of it and have a product that's going to make a, a huge amount of money and compete with the manually driven uh, uh, vehicles. And so their teleoperation from Starsky's is a really interesting idea how much can, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a few autonomous vehicle companies that tried to integrate teleoperation in the picture. Can we reduce some of the costs while still having reliability, like uh, uh, catch when the vehicle uh, fails by having teleoperation? It's an open question. Uh, so that's, that's for you scenario number two, is to uh, use teleoperation as part of the picture. Yeah, let me let me follow up on that question of how hard driving is because this this becomes a big question for researchers who are thinking about labor market impacts, right? Because we start from a perspective of what's hard or easy for humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if you were to look at truck driving prior to a lot, I mean, there's been a lot of thinking and debate in um, in academic you know research circles around sort of how you estimate labor impacts, right? What these models look like. And a lot of it is about how automatable is a job. Object recognition 
really easy for people, right? Really hard for computers. And so there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, truck drivers do that we see as, you know, super easy. And as it would have been characterized 10 years ago, routine. And it's not for a computer, right? It's a, it's, it turns out to be something that we do naturally that is, that is, you know, sort of cutting edge, right? Um, com- computer science. So on the teleoperation question, I think this is, um, this is a in- more interesting one than than people would like to sort of let on, I think, publicly. Um, there are going to be problems, right? Um, and this is one of the complexities of sort of putting these things out in the world. And if, if you see the real world of trucking, you realize, wow, it's rough. You know, there are dirt lots, there's gravel, there's salt and ice and cold weather, and there's equipment that just gets left out in the middle of nowhere and the brakes don't get maintained and somebody was supposed to service something and they didn't, you know? And so you imagine, okay, we've got this vehicle that can drive itself, which is going to require a whole lot of sensors to tell it that like the doors are still closed and the trailer's still hooked up and each of the tires has adequate pressure and, you know, any number of, you know, probably hundreds of sensors that are going to be sort of relaying information. And one of them, you know, after 500,000 miles or whatever, goes out. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, do we have some fleet of technicians sort of continually cruising the highways and sort of servicing these things as they do what? Pull themselves off to the side of the road and say, I've got a sensor fault, I'm pulling over, you know, or maybe there's some level of like critical safety, critical faults or, or, or whatever, um, it might be. So, you know, that suggests that there might be a role for teleoperation, even with self-driving. And when I push people on it in, in the conversations, they all are like, yeah, we kind of have that on the like bottom of the list, <laughs> figure out how to rescue truck, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's like on the to-do list, right? After solving the self-driving, you know, question is like, yeah, what do we do with the problems, right? I mean, now we could we can imagine like, all right, we have some, you know, protocol that the truck is not, you know, realizes the system says not safe for operation, pull to the side. Mm-hmm. Good, you have it crashed, but now you got a truck stranded on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. You're going to send out somebody to like calibrate things and check out what's going on or that sounds like expensive labor, it sounds like downtime, it sounds like the kind of things that shippers don't like to happen to their freight you know, in a, in a just in time world. And so wouldn't it be great if you could just sort of, you know, loop your way into the you know, controls of that truck and say, all right, we've got a sensor out, says me the t- says that the tire's bad, but I can see visually from the camera, looks fine. I'm going to drive it to our next depot, you know, maybe the next rider or Penske location, mm-hmm. right? Sort of all these service locations around and, and have a technician, technician take a look at it. So teleoperation often gets this, you know, um, sort of dismissive, um, you know, commentary from from other folks working on other other scenarios, but I think it's it's potentially more relevant than 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 we we hear publicly. But it's a hard problem, oh, and yeah. uh, you know, for me, I've gotten a chance to interact with people that take on hard problems and solve them, and they're rare. What Tesla has done with their data engine, so I thought autonomous driving cannot be solved without collecting a huge amount of data and organizing it well, not just collecting, but organizing it. And exactly what Tesla is doing now is what I thought it would be, like I couldn't see car companies doing that, including Tesla. And now that they're doing that, it's like, oh, okay. So it's possible to take on this huge effort seriously. To me, teleoperation is another huge effort like that. It's like taking seriously what happens when it fails. What's the, in the case of Waymo for, um, for the consumer, like ride sharing, what's the customer experience like? There's a bunch of videos online now where people are like, the car f- fails and it pulls off to the side and you call like customer service and you're basically sitting there for a long time and there's confusion and then there's a rescue that comes and they start to, dr- I mean, just the whole experience is a mess that has a ripple effect to how you trust in the, in the entirety of the experience. But like, actually taking on the problem of that failure case and revolutionizing that experience, both for trucking and for ride sharing, that's an amazing opportunity there because that feels like it would change everything. If you can reliably know when the failures happen, which they will, you have a clear plan that doesn't significantly affect the efficiency of the whole process, that that could be the game changer. 
And if teleoperation is part of that, it could be like, just like you're saying, it could be teleoperation or it could be like a fleet of rescuers that can come in, which is a similar idea. But teleoperation, obviously, that allows you to, to just have a network of monitors, of people monitoring this giant fleet of trucks and taking over when needed. And it's a beautiful vision of the future where there's millions of robots and only thousands of humans monitoring those millions of robots. That seems like that seems like a perfect dance of allowing humans to do what they do best and allowing robots to do what they do best. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think there are, um, and we just applied for an NSF. We didn't get hmm. anybody's watching, uh, <laughs> but with some folks from Wisconsin who do teleoperation, hmm. right? And and you know, some of this is used for like rovers, and you know, I mean, really you know, high stakes, difficult problems. But one of the things we wanted to study were these mines in these Rio Tinto mines in Australia where they remotely pilot the trucks. And there, there's some autonomy, I guess, and then some, but it's overseen by um, a, a remote operator. And they, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's near Perth and it's, it's quite remote. And um, they retrained the truck drivers to be the remote operators, right? Yes. Um, there's autonomy in, in the port of Rotterdam and places like that where there are jobs there. And so there, I think, you know, and maybe we'll get to this later, but, you know, there's a real policy question about sort of who's going to lose and what we do about it and, you know, whether or not we, there are opportunities there that, you know, maybe we need to put our thumb on the scale a little bit to to make sure that, you know, there there's some give back to the community that's that's taking the hit, you know? Um, so for instance, if there were teleoperation centers, you know, maybe they go in these communities that we disproportionately source truck drivers from today. Now, I mean, what does that mean? It may not be the cheapest place to do it if they don't have great connectivity. And it may not be where the upper level managers want to be, and, you know, places like that, you know, th issues like that, right? So um, I do think it's an interesting question, you know, both from sort of a, a practical a uh, scenario situation of how it's going to work, but also from a policy perspective. So there's platoons, there's teleoperation, and this is uh, taking care of some of the highway driving that we're talking about. Is there other ideas like, um, is there other ideas, scenarios that you have for autonomous trucks? Yeah. So, I mean, the the most obvious one actually is, is just, you know, uh, facility to facility, right? The sort of you know, um, it can't go everywhere, but a lot of logistics facilities are very close to interstates and they're, and they're on big commercial roads without, you know, bikes and parked cars and all that stuff. And some of the jobs that I think are really first on the chopping block are these LTL, that less than truckload, what's called line haul, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the drivers who go from terminal to terminal with those full trailers, um, and those facilities are often located strategically to avoid congestion, right? Um, and to be in big, you know, industrial facilities. So you could imagine that being, you know, the first place you see a Waymo self-driving, you know, truck roll out might be, you know, um, sort of direct facility to facility for UPS or FedEx yeah. or a less than truckload carrier. And the idea there is fully driverless, so potentially not even a driver in the truck it's just going from facility to facility, empty, zero yeah. occupancy. Yeah, and those because that labor is expensive. Uh, you know, they don't keep those drivers out overnight. Those drivers do a, do a run back and forth typically, um, or in a team, go back and forth in in one day. So, from the people you've spoken with uh, so far, what's your sense? How far are we away from which scenario is closest, and how far away are we from that scenario of autonomy? being a big part of our trucking fleet? Most folks are, are focused on another scenario, which is the exit to exit, right? Um, which looks like that urban truck ports um, thing that I laid out mm -hmm. earlier. You know, so you have a human driven truck that comes out to um, a drop lot. It meets up with an autonomous truck. The, the, that truck then, you know, drives it on the interstate to another lot. And then a human driver, um, you know, picks it up. There are a couple variations maybe on that. Um, so, or, or let me just run through the, the last two scenarios. Sure. The other thing you could do, right, is to say, all right, I've got a truck that can drive itself. Um, and I, I refer to this one as autopilot. But, um, you know, you have a human drive it out to the interstate, but rather than have that 
transaction where where the human driven truck detaches the trailer and it gets coupled up to a self driving truck. They just that human driver just hops on the interstate with that truck and goes and back and goes off duty while the truck drives itself. And and so you have a self driving truck that's not driverless, right? Um, mm -hmm. And just to clarify, because Tesla uses the term autopilot and so do airplanes, and so everybody uses the word autopilot, we're referring to essentially full autonomy, but because it's exit to exit, the truck driver is on board the truck, but they're sleeping in the back or whatever. Yeah, and this this gets to the really weedy policy questions, right? So basically for the Department of Transportation, for you to be off duty mm -hmm. for safety reasons, you have to be completely relieved of all responsibility. So that truck has to not you know, encounter a construction site or what inclement weather or whatever it might be and and call to you and say, hey, you know, or I mean, obviously, right, we're imagining connected vehicles as well, mm -hmm. right? So you're in a self-driving truck, you're in the back and trucks 20 miles ahead experience some problem, right? Um, that may require teleoperation or whatever it is, right? And it signals to your truck, hey, you know, tell the driver, 20 miles ahead, he's he's got to hop in the seat. Mm -hmm. That would mean that they're on duty according to the way that the current rules are written. They have some responsibility. And, and part of that is, you know, we need, we need them to get rest, right? Um, they, they need to have un, uninterrupted sleep.